Well, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Jonathan Citrin. This is Corey Doctorow. Uh, I, the zero thing to do is to give you a warning that this is being recorded, transcribed, webcast, et cetera, et cetera. So anything you say can and likely will be used against you. Um, in the court of public opinion. In the court of public opinion. Uh, and Corey, we are so pleased to have you back at the Berkman Center. You were just pointing out it's been over a decade since you visited. Um, nothing really has changed in the intervening time, but yeah. we'll come up with some stuff to talk about. Well, they got rid of the blink tag since then. <laughs> That's a victory for the good folks. Um, and uh, I guess by way of introduction, um, I guess I would describe Corey as uh, a true polymath, an entrepreneur, a writer, fiction and nonfiction. Um, Somebody with kind of academic values, somebody with a compass who has a clear vision of various futures and which ones are preferable to which. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if you'd want to be described as a spokesperson for anyone. I saw on Wikipedia you're listed in a genre of post-cyberpunk. <laughs> so that 10 years, we've gone from cyberpunk to post -cyberpunk. I was I was in an anthology called the post-cyberpunk anthology, actually probably two now. So yeah. I think that might be where that comes from. But uh, those are just marketing categories. And as we know, everything is miscellaneous mm. now. So. <laughs> so says David Weinberger. And we're probably ready for the post-post-cyberpunk. Uh, actually, era. I just read a science fiction novel that, unlike the science fiction of the 80s, which was largely about people who grew up reading science fiction. The protagonist was always someone who grew up reading science fiction. This was a science fiction novel about someone who grew up reading science fiction about people who grew up reading science fiction. <laughs> I thought that was, that was beautifully reflexive. Yes, yes. So uh, you've chosen to title uh, your presentation today, Kill All DRM Within Five or ten years? Ten years. Ten years. Sorry. Hence Apollo. Apollo 1201. We do this not because it is easy, but because it's hard. Uh-huh. Yeah. Very good. So this is your moon shot. Mm -hmm. um, and Corey had planned to sort of possibly be ready to do kind of an opening lecture of sorts, but we actually decided we're going to just start and continue conversationally, and he'll get the points worked in, and we've got a great brain trust in this room, and we'll find a way to make it conversational quickly. Um, so maybe we should just open with having you unpack that sure. very gravid title. So I'll start with the why and then move on to the how. So the why is that um, what had started as a pretty um, cabined off original sin, which was uh, saying, well, if you have a thing that you use to entertain you and someone has designed it to only entertain you in some ways, that we're going to make it a felony to figure out how to be entertained in other ways, right? So if you've got a DVD that's only supposed to work in Europe, we're going to make it a felony to make it work in America. And as bad as that was, and as much as that was a ripoff, it seemed like it was pretty thoroughly contained. But you know, a funny thing happened on the way to the 21st century, which is that um, the distraction rectangle in your pocket became something beyond uh, a thing to throw birds at pigs and also became a distraction rectangle who knows who all your friends are and everything you say to them and has a camera and a microphone and you discuss sensitive things in front of it and take it into the toilet and the bathroom and it knows how to get into your bank account and talk to your doctor. And we've made it a felony to do stuff to that device to change or inspect its workings. Um, and because uh, any flaw in that device is a thing that would help you uh, jailbreak it to, to let you do stuff that's, that's not permitted. Um, pointing out those flaws has also become a felony. So if you, if you read the 1201 docket at the Copyright Office this year where they uh, entertain suggestions for, um, uh, for uh, exceptions to this rule, we heard from people who said, I, my tractor won't let me drive it because it has a lock on it, and that lock protects the copyrighted software in the tractor. And people who said, my, I, I, I have decided to take the risk of taking five years off my life as a type 1 diabetic, and I'm going to stick myself and take my own blood assays rather than wearing an insulin pump, because I looked at the source code on this thing, and while it's a felony for me to tell you what I found, I think that you could kill me in my boots from 30 feet. And so I'm not going to wear this insulin pump. And we heard from people who worked on voting machines and cars, and we've seen lots since. And you know. The, the thing is that if you can felonize changing a device's configuration, there's lots of business model opportunities. And as computers have gotten into everything, those business model opportunities have become increasingly tempting. So you may ask yourself, why does John Deere care 
if you jailbreak your tractor. Well, tractors have got um, torque sensors on their wheels that do centimeter accurate soil surveys while they go around the farmer's field. That information is not copyrighted nor copyrightable because it's factual, but the um, module that you have to break to get into that data is also a module that protects the operating system, which is clearly a copyrighted work. And so Monsanto won't let the farmer see that, and it's a felony to try and see it on your own. And what Mon or Deere rather, and what Deere does is they sell it to Monsanto. So the farmer doesn't get it, but Monsanto does. Monsanto will sell it back to the farmer in a package with their seed. Uh, but that's only like the kind of the mustache twirl of the of the evil plan. The like the full pinky beside the corner of the mouth <laughs> is that they have insight into entire regions um, uh, likely coming agricultural yields, and they use it to play futures markets. So it's kind of a ten figure bet on uh, a new line of business for them. And you can kind of see this rippling out through the whole world of internet of things, computers are everywhere, um, where more and more devices that are more and more critical to us are covered by these TPMs that are a felony to remove. And we therefore can't discuss the security dimensions of those. And that's a, a huge problem. And we're doubling down on that problem every day. So TPP's uh, intellectual property cha chapter leak this week. Uh, yesterday, Motherboard had a great article on one dimension of that, which is that it has a, a, an obligation on signatories to allow for court orders that um, uh, order the seizure and destruction of circumvention devices. Uh, and um, so that's a requirement. Every legal system under TPP must have that. And then they may have an exemption for security. Uh, and what we know about those musts and mays in intellectual property treaties and trade agreements is the musts always get implemented and the mays almost never do. And so all those tools that were used to find the flaws in the voting machines and the cars and the tractors and the implants are all going to be things that are liable to seizure and destruction. So that's the must. Now, or that's, the, that's the, the, the why. The what is uh, how we're going to get rid of the, the, the 1201 and all of its analogs around the world is through the kind of Larry Lessig theory of change, which is that the world is driven by code, law, norms, and markets. Um, so the law part is that um, there are lots of people who violate 1201 all the time uh, in the normal course of their security research. And it's the love that dare not speak its name. Right? So people don't talk about it in public fora because they don't want to get clobbered for it. Um, and when they do talk about it, the industry gets to decide uh, who they sue and who they don't. So when Ed Felton breaks music DRM, uh, they like they sent a threat to him. But as soon as they realized who he was, they not only like rescinded the threat, they covenanted never to come after him for breaking that DRM because they can afford to like just not have jurisprudence made where it's likely to go the wrong way. I love the story that Ed Felton has like diplomatic immunity. That's right, yeah. I mean, he one of the plans for getting rid of 1201 no was just to just identify every noxious TPM and just have Ed break it, right? That's like, it's the, it's the, the Ed Felton plan. It's like, it's like getting Superman to like sort of solve all of your problems for you. But we have a more scalable solution. Um, so the, the reason we've never been able to challenge 1201 with the right facts is because we, the, um, only way to bring that challenge is to get sued. And getting sued is not a thing you get to choose. And everybody who used TPMs was playing an iterated game where they could afford to let one TPM go because they needed the rest of them. But you look at Deer. Deer has one TPM. And if it doesn't work, they don't need the DMCA. So we now have a target-rich environment where someone who's got the right facts, who goes public with them in a way that threatens one of those businesses, is likely to attract litigation from a party who is not in, a, who doesn't care if losing destroys the DMCA because they don't need the DMCA if they can't use it in this one instance. And so I think we're going to attract litigation. And over the 10 years that that litigation proceeds, we're going to do the norms, we're going to do the code, and we're going to do the the, the um, markets. So uh, once. The um, DMCA is uh, non-determinate. Once we don't know whether it's going to be legal or not legal to jailbreak, we enter a zone where people who have an appetite for risk can think about making investments in technologies that jailbreak other technologies, right? Uh, the, the people who make third-party inkjet cartridges for the entire Internet of Things. And the reason that companies use TPMs is to command monopoly rents, right? It's to charge extra for service and parts and to charge extra for consumables. And so every one of those markets is an opportunity that someone else can unlock. You know, as Jeff Bezos once said in a remarkably candid moment to the publishers, your margin is my opportunity. 
And if we can get firms to start those businesses, then we enter a zone that looks a lot like the VCR fight, where in 76, nobody knew what the VCR was going to do to the film industry. By 84, there were 6 million VCRs in the field. The judges had all seen and used VCRs. And when, this, when you go to the Supreme Court and you say the VCR is the Boston Strangler of the American film industry, you just sound like an idiot. And so we have 10 years on the way to the Supreme Court to get lots of firms to start lots of equivalents to uh, the VCR, right? Lots of things that jailbreak, that, may, that command, that create businesses, that do good things for the public. Remember that service and repair are three to 4% of the US GDP, and it's intrinsically local and SME oriented because you don't send your phone to China to get it fixed, and you don't take your car to uh, Mexico to get it fixed. It all has to be onshore and local to you. Um, and uh, so all of those businesses will spring up, and they will all be an opportunity for us to show the sky doesn't fall. All of America's international trade partners, who now have 1201 equivalents because the USTR is patient zero in the 1201 infection and has required all of America's trading partners to have it, every one of those has effectively a suicide pact with America. We will force our industry not to do this profitable line of, of, of work because America won't either. And once America starts doing it, every one of those countries is ripe to change their own laws because suicide pacts are mutual. If the other guy's not gonna jump off the bridge, why would you, right? And so activists and industry in all of those countries can pick it off, and by the time we get to the Supreme Court, the USTR won't be able to say, you're gonna make us breach our trade agreements because those obligations will already be dead letters thanks to the repeal all around the world. So that's the, that's the, the normative, and the technical and the market-based way that we're going to solve this. Wow. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that incredibly high signal-to-noise ratio presentation, which I think some people are probably like, yes, and others are like still unpacking it and Googling various acronyms that you've used. Um, but uh, it's, it's wonderful. Let me just back up a second. Starting with the observation that I think I've never seen anybody so thrilled and excited at the prospect of 10 years of litigation, <laughs> especially when there's no prospect of money at the end of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're like doing this to strike down a law. And of course, the, the, the law you've been talking about is a part of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act of 1998, Section 1201, which put um, somewhat crudely makes a felony, among other things, uh, hacking certain systems that contain uh, material covered by the copyright statute. Um, but let me ask you a more theoretical question and a big picture, because you're not just wanting to eliminate a law that makes a felony the act of hacking a system that protects copyrighted materials for one reason or another. Uh, especially when a lot of the mustache twirling you point out isn't because the hacking would be to get to copyrighted materials. The copyrighted thing is just a hook to hang. Yeah. In know, fact, stuff. in DRM right. standards bodies, they call it the hook IP. Right. It's the thing that you hang the, the restriction on. Yes. Yeah. So, but let me ask you then a more theoretical question, because do you actually want to eliminate all DRM? Is the ideal world you would see one in which... Basically, companies putting products out cannot encrypt their OSs, their data, having that all be affirmatively visible to and possibly writable by the user. Is that the world you're wanting? So uh, I guess that's the part that I usually gloss over because I, I, I uh, take it as a given that DRM doesn't work, right? So like normally you have Alice and Bob and Carol, right? And Alice and Bob assume that Carol can see their message in transit and know how they scrambled it because you don't use you, you don't make up your own ciphers right Be, for the same reason you don't make up your own physics to calculate the the joist strength in this building right it's like I hope peer reviews did. well no I, I I really hope they didn't right like if you saw a firm of engineers who are going to renovate your house and take out some walls and put in reinforcing steel joists and they said we have proprietary math that we use to calculate the load stresses don't hire that firm of engineers right because your building will fall on your head. We have like one methodology for figuring out whether something is true, and that's, that's peer review. And so it has to be non-proprietary. So, so Alice and Bob assume Carol knows how they scramble the message, and they assume that, uh, that she can get a copy of the message because it's going over the public internet or over a satellite or whatever, right? So how do Alice and Bob keep a secret from Carol? Because they have a key and Carol doesn't. And if the ciphers are good and we think the ciphers are good, then with the key, Carol will never ever be able to uh, extract 
the, the data, right? She'll never be able to render a clear text. That's awesome, right? The distraction re rectangle in your pocket doesn't just throw pigs at birds. It can also scramble a message so thoroughly that um, if every, com every hydrogen atom in the universe were a computer and it did nothing between now and the universe running cold but guessed keys, it would run out of universe before it ran out of keys. So the ciphers, if they work, they work. And that's called excellence. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a high quality cipher, right? And so what we assume is that Carol doesn't have the key. But the DRM model, which the simplest case is Netflix, I send you a movie, um, I send you a secret to decrypt the movie, I don't want you to make a player that has a save button. And to make the player, you would have to get that secret, um, and then you could very easily make that player. And so I've hidden the key somewhere in the player that I gave you. Um, that model doesn't work because it's just Alice and Bob, right? Like, Alice has a thing, Bob has a thing he doesn't want Alice to know, and then Bob tells Alice. So, so far I hear you saying that there's kind of a theoretical problem in digital rights management. Uh -huh. Namely, it's not just keeping a secret between two people, which is something that you think can work sure. and is totally. very important to preserve yeah. for individual freedom, but trying to keep a secret between a company and 10 million consumers, showing them a little bit but not the rest, that that has structural problems with So it. let me put it this way. You cannot give secrets to people you are adverse to and expect them to remain secret, uh -huh. right? I mean, that, that just seems tautological. Like, you also can't put safes in bank robbers' living rooms. Like, it doesn't matter how good the safe is. But right? yet, and this is, this is getting to my question then, um, it's not as if safes don't work. And safes really are about keeping stuff away from third parties. That's not an Alice and Bob configuration, even though, again, you don't leave it in the living room of a robber. Um, but safes still work. And the way uh, to invoke Larry again, and it's funny, I thought you, that Larry's method of social change is going to be run for president. That's right. <laughs> Version 2.0. <laughs> yeah, so right. you heard it here fo first, folks. That's Corey's right. going to run for the president. The first foreign-born president yeah. since George Washington. <laughs> um, but uh, I guess my question, though, was if Larry once said, small fences can keep in large mammals. Right. And so DRM can, in fact, be good enough for corporate purposes in that people like you and maybe people with stickers on their laptops are going to figure out how to see the deleted scenes they're not supposed to see without pain in the movie. Mm -hmm. But, you know, 90% of the people are going to stay within the lines. That's kind of the iTunes story, isn't it? The problem is break once, break everywhere. Uh -huh. So the, 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 it's, uh, if I figure out where the key is in Netflix... I can make a player, and that player is, to all intents and purposes, better than Netflix player. Right? The reason it's better than Netflix player is that nobody wants a Netflix without a save as button. They may be indifferent to whether there's a save as button, but nobody uh, woke up and said, I really want to find that Netflix client that I'm sure doesn't have a save as button. And so once I can distribute my tool, uh, the fact that the um, that uh, there's another tool that's inferior to it that's floating around out there. So you have, there's two possible models, right? One is that Netflix doesn't need DRM at all because everybody only wants to stream. And then there's the other one, which is that there are enough people who don't want to stream and want to save their videos that it's an actual existential crisis for Netflix. If the first case is true, then we don't need DRM. And if the second case is true, then DRM won't help them. And yet... When you present this argument to them, mm -hmm. I suspect they're not like, you're right. No, what they say, what they say is, uh, well, that sounds right, except our studio partners don't, don't like this, right? And then when you, say to the, when you go to the studios, they say, uh, those eggheads know how to do this, they just don't want to, yes. right? I, and I've heard variations on that argument a hundred million times in standards bodies and in treaty-making bodies and everywhere else. But also, this argument maybe had its apogee in 2002, 2004, mm -hmm. basically pre-rectangular device mm -hmm. that distracts you. Mm -hmm. Because it's when we happened to have, through historical accident, general purpose computers for which, as you say, crack once, available anywhere, mm -hmm. all you have to do is double click on the hamster icon mm -hmm. and <laughs> we're off to the races. Mm -hmm. That's harder to do these days, given that the platforms we run 
are mediated by app stores and our services rather than products because they can be, because there is saturating network so that something can be withdrawn from an iPhone. You can land in China mm -hmm. and your Apple News app stops working because China told Apple it had better. So another way of saying that is you land in China and your news app stops working because you can't buy a news app from a company that hasn't made promises to the Chinese government because there's DRM that stops you from installing a second software store. And not, not like I went to Cydia and I found this elaborate jailbreak and I got it, but like I was at Walmart the other day and hanging in the point of sale was a free dongle that you plug into your phone that auto jailbreaks it and, you, and installs another software store that um, has gone out and cherry picked the uh, top 10% of ISVs who sell into the iTunes store and offered them a 15% instead of a 30% commission. This dongle and does not exist, correct? The only reason it doesn't exist is 1201. And if 1201 wasn't there, that dongle would be in the point of sale at every retailer. And now just popping up through the stack to my original question, that's the world you want. Not, right. And your point, when you said you gloss over whether every manufacturer should basically be required to share everything freely, you say you're kind of indifferent to that because so long as you get rid of 1201, de facto the market will push that anyway. Yeah, you I don't mind the arms race. You're like, yeah, no, no, no. I don't like. I don't want to. I don't want to have compelled software manufacturing standards, right? Where you're not allowed to put DRM in. I just don't think that. I think that that dimension or that decision takes on a new dimension where programmers who report security vulnerabilities in your product can go to jail. Um, that's, that, that's why it's an ethical decision, right? That's why it has this ethical, legal, fraught dimension. The decision to make dumb commercial choices, right, to put anti-features in your devices, is one I may argue against as a kind of normative question. I don't think we need a law against it. But the it. reason you don't think you need a law against it is because of the contingent fact that Walmart will offer dongles that cracks yeah. everything so long as it's not against 12.1. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, ISVs hate being tenant farmers in Apple's store. ISVs right? being independent, independent software, software vendors. vendors. You know, if you look at like the top 10 games in the Apple game store, they haven't changed, the manufacturers haven't changed in five years. There's one business model to become a game seller into the iTunes store or to the App Store, and that's to get bought by one of those five companies because they have a lock on the distribution channel and on the marketing into that store, right? Everybody except those five companies who makes mobile games hates Apple's store model. And every one of them could end up in a different store with different characteristics for different kinds of marketing. And if it turns out that Apple's store model, where you get this thing where only five companies are allowed to make games for mobile platforms for the rest of the time, is the one that people want, I'll be disappointed, but at least, I, uh, um, at least we'll have a, a means to change it that doesn't involve risking criminal prosecution. Your argument still depends on kind of a difference between server and client. And by that I mean way back in the day when Captain Midnight hijacked HBO for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I think just had a screen that said Captain Midnight right. instead of HBO, which was slightly better received than what was showing at HBO at the time. <laughs> um, my guess is you'd be okay saying that's not okay. Yeah, sure. And my question about server and client is to the extent that you can start to stream everything, you can stream the data, you can stream the service, the colloquial notion that you lean on of once you've got something in your custody, the idea that if you take a soldering gun to it or the digital equivalent, you could go to jail seems crazy. You're in your shed, you've got it in your mitts, mm -hmm. you paid for it, you own it. But if it's more and more a service, and in order to effectuate the hacking you're talking about is not a dongle in the phone. Suppose the phone is just completely a client and all of the action is happening at apple.com, for which now no dongle makes any difference. You've got to hack apple.com to allow those extra Or apps. run another server and then change the phone so it trusts so it can, your server and not a third party server. Yes. Right? Like the idea that I have to, That's that I can't Facebook know and do it. That's why Facebook is facing such competition from diaspora. <laughs> <laughs> well, so there are other factors, right? And and like it's like um, that that line from the uh, from from the Woody Guthrie song. Uh, there's there's plenty of things. Like Joe, why did Joe Lewis join the army? There's plenty of things wrong with America, but Hitler won't help him, right? Like Godwin Godwin and one. Uh, there's plenty of things wrong with the way markets work, 
But having the, a mechanism whereby firms who take this like minimal technological step can sue and criminalize anyone who I get it. Them, That's your strongest help. base. Right. That's your, so I one of the problems yeah. with Facebook is CFAA. And once we figured out how to kill 1201 CFAA, or maybe Computer Fraud, Fraud and Abuse Act, yes. which make, criminalizes breaking license agreements, even if they're, they have unconscionable terms, even if they're not negotiated, even if they're yes. otherwise not. Um, uh, wouldn't, other, wouldn't rise normally to the threshold of enforcement by the person who imposed the agreement on you, and, but may rise to the threshold of enforcement once the government agrees to pay the bill to enforce your EULAs for you. Uh, so if you were making um, uh, a diaspora that was genuinely adverse to Facebook and was able to violate its EULA, you could do things like crawl people's walls. Import all your friends. Import all your one. friends and their updates. And, and you would like to see that possibility, which also means, though, that's there a CFAA could be thing. Bad folks that could crawl Facebook and steal all your friends' data or something. Um, I would like maybe some principle where. Um, well, let me think. How would this work? So I don't do I don't work on CFAA because it's a whole different set of issues. There's only one of me. But but <laughs> as a Gedanken experiment, like how would you how would you construct a statute? You would say, okay, so the data that you generated is a thing that you have an affirmative right to, and you have the affirmative right to use a tool that can extract that data from a third party who won't give it to you by, if you ask nicely, um, and that third party loses a cause of action, provided that they can't show material damages from the extraction. So in other words, if you didn't crash their servers repeatedly in a way that cost them a lot of money. Yeah. Like I think there's some wiggle room in there and it's like I just thought that up now. Yep, yep. But I think that's not a terrible And probably standard. the theoretical answer rather than the practical answer, and I expect you're trying a practical one to the question, would just be stuff that is raining on Facebook's parade shouldn't be a big deal. Stuff that maybe ruins the user's privacy or experience is something you'd be ready to protect. Sure, and you know, I, I think that um, you know, I, I firmly believe that markets have a place in enabling speech, right? Like, I am, I am able to make a video, but I'm not able to make a YouTube. And I believe that people make YouTubes in part because of commercial impetus. We may be able to do it over time also in non-commercial ways. So I don't think we... When you say make a YouTube, because often when people say YouTube, no, make I a mean, video. You like mean make, make a YouTube. YouTube. Make YouTube, yeah. Yes. Okay. So the, the like Venn diagram of everyone who has a video to make at, with everybody who can make a video hosting service has a really small intersection. And so without some mechanism whereby we can expand the size of that intersection, right? people have access to tools like YouTube, uh, we, we will limit speech. right? So we need to have commercial actors that host things and so on. Um, I think that, you know, that what we see in computer law is a microcosm of wider problems of laws that favor incumbency and firms at scale um, that uh, um, are you know redound through lots of other areas. Yes. And I've said a lot that like I don't believe in saving the internet because I think the internet's the most important thing, right? Like we have climate change and we have pandemics and refugee crises, all of these being related. Um, uh, but the way that we're going to fight those fights and the terrain on which they'll be won or lost is on the internet, mm -hmm. right? So you know it's it's. It, that's the only reason, really, to care about the internet is, is because of all the fights we'll win or lose on it. Uh -huh. uh, we should open it up. Yeah. So, uh, and I've just kind of worked to try to establish the sure. boundaries of your thinking, where you're, what, what you're calling for, what you're not. Um, but let's open it up to uh, brief comments, questions, thoughts. We have a microphone that you should wait to arrive to you so it gets on the webcast. Wow, this is the... Well, I understand that it was all like really self-explanatory and not controversial. <laughs> <laughs> Let's let the lawsuit begin. And feel free to tell us who you are. Um, hi, my name is Eric Skase. Um, you've written a book recently. Um, under this environment that you describe, it sounds like the book could be digitally distributed by anybody who cares to, and you potentially would receive no compensation. How is that the environment you really want to see? Or what happens to authors in general? I realize you intended this if not a hard ball, a medium ball. I think it turns out to be a soft ball, but go, go ahead. Yeah, Craig. so I don't know if you know this, but my first novel was the first book ever distributed under a Creative Commons license, simultaneous with its commercial publication. <laughs> this and dog food you're eating, you realize it's dog food. <laughs> and, in the, and, and over the last 12 years, I've published something like 24 books under various CC licenses and free distribution licenses. I've had multiple New York Times bestsellers in that time, and uh, just through 
I think my fifth six-figure advance from a major commercial publisher. So I feel okay about that proposition. Um, I guess the thing is that there's a kind of rail politic. So going back to hiding keys in devices that you give to adversaries is no good. Um, and that means, and break once, break everywhere, uh, means that anything, any book of mine, any book that is popular that you want to read for free, regardless of whether it has a CC license, and regardless of what happens with 1201 in the future, is today in the world in which you can go to jail for five years for breaking 1201, is today available for free without DRM because someone's cracked it and put it online in about as many clicks as it takes to buy it. Right? And so they're, like every single payment made for a book is in some sense voluntary. Voluntary, yeah. And so you need a, uh, uh, and so if you're going to make the case for voluntary payments, there's kind of two things you can do. You can, there's a carrot and there's a stick, right? And the, the carrot is, uh, I'm a nice guy, you want to support me, a bunch of normative propositions, right? Like, you like my art, I like you, we're all in this together. And then the stick is, um, I'm going to put you in jail, right, or cost you your kid's college fund if you are entertained by my books in a way that I don't like. And um, the carrot and the stick are antithetical to each other. And I think that there's a lot more potential dividend from the carrot, en energy in, um, uh, dividend out, uh, than there is from the stick. I think the stick has been like pretty unsuccessful. And I think like the empirical research on this supports it. Like, thing, you know, like th uh, market propositions that seem fair seem to really take a huge bite out of piracy. Right, like um, uh, streaming services have been amazing for piracy, uh, even though they have DRM, and even though there's lots of things I don't like about them, and even though they have unfair compensation schemes, and even though they deal with the big four labels and the big five publishers at the expense of the artists whose work those those publishers control. Uh, nevertheless, those streaming services have been hugely successful at reducing piracy, whereas suing 19,000 music fans like didn't stop music piracy from growing ahead of the rate that the internet was growing. So that's interesting. This gets back to small fences keeping large mammals, because we're trying to figure out whether it's a fence. You're saying it's like a suggested line. No, I don't even think it's that. I think the only reason that they use DRM is because it stops people from making services that compete with them. Uh -huh. That all it does is stop stop someone from building a meta streamer that lets you subscribe to five of them and get the one that's free here and figure out how to beat the geo wall there and do whatever, right? And also skip the ads, right? Like that's what they want DRM for. So that's small fences keep out large shepherds. You're actually thinking that the mammals are We are we are headed into a tragedy of the commons and whether or not the sheep can be made to shit grass. Uh, <laughs> which is the Napster model, right? I That's downloaded. funny, I thought the metaphor was overextended even before you said yeah. that. <laughs> uh, I don't know about shepherds and mammals. Uh, I think that this is, that maybe this is, this is T-Boom Pickens and the poor country but, uh, lawyer talking about how he's just a shepherd with some mammals yes. when really he's big agribusiness. But I'm, it is, it does call to mind John Perry Barlow's amazing Wired article in like I think the second volume of Wired mm -hmm. 1994 uh, called The Economy of Ideas mm -hmm. in which he took a grim joy in dancing on the grave of the content industries as he projected out what the digital revolution would do and the way that you were describing how you've had perfectly good success mm -hmm. opening up the books voluntarily rather than waiting for them to get cracked uh, he was talking about the Grateful Dead model of mm -hmm. collecting all sorts of money from live shows rather than having to confine the use of the music. Now, there are bands that don't like to tour. So yeah, there's two rejoinders. One is, right. what if you don't perform live well? And the other one is, you're an outlier. Yes. Right? So what if you don't perform live well? Um, it, every technological era, because entertainment is a, uh, the entertainment industry, industrial activity related to entertainment, um, is always technological. That's the part that makes it industrial as opposed to just sort of standing on a corner declaiming stories. The industry is the printing press, the telegraph, the telephone, the TV, whatever. That's the industry part. Every technological era has favored different characteristics when it was uh, all about live stage performance and the technology was a microphone and a proscenium and a door with a lock on it that you could use to exclude people who hadn't paid for tickets. The, um, the thing that it favored were people who had virtuosity and, or who had charisma, not necessarily virtuosity, right? People so your who, point there is there's no baseline that is in right. Place. There's no there's artist who gets so the, all of those artists who couldn't who who weren't charismatic but yeah. really rocked with their axes. Those artists got careers as recording artists, largely at the expense 
of the Vought of Aliens, who had a great show, but it didn't carry on. For which you're like, given that there's vinyl. no baseline. Yeah, I mean, you know, like, like do we, is the job of entertainment policy or communications policy to ensure that last year's lottery winners go on winning the lottery forever at the expense of next year's potential lottery winners? Or is it to just make sure that we have a plurality of, um, of media produced by the largest plurality of artists and the largest plurality of me formats for yes. the largest plurality of audiences. Or as Eben Moglen once said, and then denied ever having said it, um, he said the cultural, economic, and legal circumstances um, that produced the Egyptian pyramids haven't obtained for several thousand years, but like there was a set of circumstances for which that was the sensible thing to do. You don't have right? to go back to Egypt. You can go to the, the first yeah. copyright fight, which was the Protestant Reformation, yeah. right? Cathedral, one church let, let cathedrals get built. Right, uh, uh, diffuse church, which arose out of the printing press and copying and copying without permission at the uh, 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 at the expense of and against the wishes of the most powerful, important people who built all the most beautiful things in the world, uh, resulted in lots of weak Kirks. Right, and that was a different. It was a different world, and cathedrals are an unequivocal good. We still visit them today. Who who would roll back the Protestant Reformation? Now. From the sublime to the ridiculous, can I ask? Can I just mention yes. outliers? Everybody oh, yeah. who succeeds in the arts is an outlier. Take all the people who funnel into the arts, like everybody who ever bought a guitar and thought someday I'll earn my living from this, and compare the other end of the funnel, and it's a Six Sigma event. It's right? such a hopeless crapshoot right. that anybody should just like, figure that And when you look closely at every successful artist in every successful moment, every one of them was an outlier in their own way. Every one of them made things that were distinct. There's no like uniform, perfectly spherical artist uh, on a, uh, of uniform density on a frictionless surface, right? Like the artists are all, they are all the, the, the coins that fell all the way to the bottom of the very long staircase. Um, I was going to ask about uh, HTML5. Uh huh. Tim's ears just grew points. <laughs> so, how can we unpack that briefly for a general audience? Sure. So, there's a question, and Tim, you can tell me whether I, this is um, a fair uh, version of it. So, some of the uh, media companies and some of the browser vendors have uh, asked the W3C to begin standardizing means by which technical protection measures can end up in browsers uh, without, as a standardized way to avoid some of the problems. Because making DRM work is really hard because it is by definition like kind of trying to avoid, uh, trying to stop people from doing things that they want, which means that when it goes wrong, when you try to troubleshoot it, it actually like works against you. Uh, and anyone who's ever used TPMs and DRM knows this. Like one of my co-editors on Boing Boing this week configured his iCloud wrong and took too many attempts to try to get it right and all of his media is now locked out for the next 90 days. And this is like a common thing because the DRM thinks that you're, the reason for DRM is that the vendor doesn't trust you. So anything you do that's unusual uh, like escalates the, the thing. And so DRM is really hard to get right and hard to make work across multiple platforms. So there's this project underway, EME, it, it encrypted um, media extensions that's gonna be baked into HTML uh, that uh, if it goes forward, that will, in theory, make this easier. But the problem from my perspective is not whether people make DRM or don't make DRM. The problem from my perspective is whether that makes browsers into products covered by Section 1201 of the DMCA, and therefore reservoirs of long live vulnerabilities. And if the idea of HTML5 is to replace apps and uh, native code with, with interoperable bytecode that allows us to control everything from pacemakers to cars so that we do, we're not in app silos anymore, then what that means is that the user interface for your HVAC system and your um, uh, implanted defibrillator will be a covered product, presumptively, if it's using HTML5 to, to organize it. And I have a proposal that I've taken the W3C with, it must be said, a fair bit of welcome and I think we're moving forward with it. And if any of you are involved in the W3C and want to work on this with me, I'd be very happy to talk to you, that I think solves this problem. And what it is, is it's a covenant, or at least solves some of the problem. It's a covenant on the part of people who participate in standard setting for DRM at the World Wide Web Consortium, through which they promise not to bring actions under 1201 or its international analogs for people who implement browsers or for people who report vulnerabilities and make tools that demonstrate vulnerabilities. So you don't have an upstream problem with a framework as part of the web to have a channel for DRM to happen. It's just the 1201 piece you don't It's like. the 1201 piece. I would argue that browsers would be better if they didn't have that, but I also think that 
browsers that do have that will very quickly have defeat devices made for them that get around it. And, and I, all the negative consequences of that being in the browser will go away. Uh, I, think that, like, I think that designing devices to um, attack their owners, which is to say uh, refuse to do their owner's bidding, is a bad idea, not just like on its face, but also because to make that happen, you must perforce design uh, systems that obfuscate their workings from their owners. So if the owner says, like, is there a process running called HAL 9000, I can't let you do that, Dave, EXE, <laughs> the operating system, if it says, yes, there is, and here's its process ID, then the owner will, every time they try to get their computer to do something that they think is legitimate and the computer won't do it, they'll just kill that process. And so you have to have some That's mechanism. safe with the robber where all the robber has to do is delete the safe. That's right. And, and so where the combination is written underneath it, right? So you have to have some way whereby the operating system can be made to detect whether it is talking to the owner. And when it's talking to the owner, in some cases, it gives unreliable answers to questions about what files are in its operating system and what processes are running on its processor. And I think that's a bad idea for like malware reasons. You know, the Sony rootkit in 2005, they um, distributed software on audio CDs that was supposed to block you from in, um, ripping CDs. And the, the way that it did that is it ran a program that checked to see if you were uh, ripping CDs. And if you were, it would try and stop that program. And to stop you from deleting the thing that watched for CDs, they changed your operating system so it could no longer see processes that began with the string dollar sign sys dollar sign. So if that string was there, your process manager and your file system would no longer see those files, right? And so if you said, is there a program running called no CD rip, you know, dollar sign sys dollar sign no CD rip dot exe, your computer would say no even if there was. And your claim again is the only way to implement DRM in the absence especially of 1201, is to have to resort to increasingly Baroque tricks like that. Yeah, you have to hide what the computer because is doing. otherwise you say there's the Walmart dongle or its equivalent. Yeah, That's I mean, there's, and there's a difference here between an are you sure dialogue and uh, I can't let you do that dialogue, uh -huh. right? The are you sure dialogue, if it says, like, if the answer is no and no, then you will find or source or make a bypass for that are you sure dialogue. Um, but the I can't let you do that, Dave, where the uh, only answer is cancel, uh, is one that is a different model. You have to be adverse to the user. Yes. So what happened with Sony was virus writers started writing viruses that were prepended with dollar sign SYS dollar sign because there were 300,000 computer networks in the US government and military that were already infected with the Sony rootkit and their antivirus software would no longer be able to see this, right? So like we, we exist in a, in a hostile, technological environment where many people are adverse to our interests who are criminals or spies, right? Uh, and we want our computers to tell us what our computers are doing so that we can figure out if those computers are operating on our behalf. It is funny. I think at the end of the day, even Sony agreed that the entire incident was regrettable and not an example of best practices. That was after the, FT <laughs> that was after the FTC judgment, though, right? Like, before the FTC judgment, the CEO of Sony, because it was just the 10th anniversary. My guess is that the Sony people, once, like, the people yeah. in charge found out what had happened. Oh, no, 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 the no. FTC, the CEO like, no, 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 no. The CEO of Sony at the FTC hearing said most people don't even know what a rootkit is, what's the big deal? Uh -huh. After the judgment, he was like, uh -huh. that was a regrettable inc incident. Right up until the judgment, he was like, you don't even know what a rootkit is. Why do you care if I you see. have one? Your claim is that like, Sony found the judgment regrettable. Yeah, I think that's right. Okay. Well, and um, evidenced by the fact that they sued a bunch of firm, uh, firms and individuals who jailbroke their stuff later. Yes. Yeah. Um, reactions either to this or more generally... Uh, Ed, you've got the mic, or you've got, got the, the mic. mic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, back. back, Christian Murthy. Um, so you said the magic words defeat device, which had me think of Volkswagen. And I sure did. That talks to the problem of companies doing things that are adverse to the interests of their, uh, of their consumers. The one thing I haven't heard in your talk, though, is what do we do in an Internet of Things world to prevent attack, right? So one could argue that encrypting source code is a good thing because it makes it more than trivially, trivially difficult for someone to interfere with a mission-critical system. Um, I don't know what penalties we need to back that up with, but what would you propose as a solution to that problem? Oh, I think encrypting source code so that the owner or user of the system 
can see it, but third parties who are adverse to them can't. It's a great idea. Uh, I just think that encrypting source code so that the person who owns the system doesn't have the keys is a terrible idea. Um, I, I, I totally agree. And I think that if you look at VW, what VW had going for it was that it was a felony to, to get into the CAN bus and figure out what its emission system was doing. Uh, that's also why GM has a car, had, had uh, it, or it was Ford rather, had um, all these cars where you can defeat their keyless fob entry systems with a $15 defeat device. And that's why Chrysler was able to field 1.4 million cars that they subsequently had to recall but that can be remote controlled over the internet. You're saying implicitly then, possibly about to be explicit, that if there weren't a 1201 barrier to really trying to interrogate that key fob, the result would be a stronger yes. key fob. Plenty wrong with the world, but Hitler won't help, right? It's, it's still hard, like we know this from OpenSSL, it is still hard to find vulns in technology that you can audit. I don't think anyone seriously argues that it's easier to find vulns in co code you can't audit, though. Uh, you know, the, Which the, does possibly mean the DRM would get stronger if there weren't the legal protection, because it would have to be all technical protection, but you yeah, say maybe. DRM doesn't work. I, I mean, that's like, that's like, so like I have a, I have chronic low back pain, and if there was localized anti-gravity devices, my back would feel better. The, like, and so everybody, people have made localized anti-gravity devices, but every single one of them was a charlatan who made a fraud, right? I was and the, not expecting the answer the, to go in the that argument, <laughs> The argument that if only they were subject to more rigorous peer review, the anti-gravity devices would get better, seems to me to be unlikely. DRM is an anti-gravity device. Yeah, it's snake oil, right? So snake oil doesn't get better with peer review. Uh, that's what peer review does, is it separates snake oil from things that are promising. Yes. Over here. George Mokre, independent scholar from Central Square. Um, to go back to the tragedy of the unregulated com comments, Eleanor Ostrom, Eleanor Ostrom, Eleanor Ostrom. Okay. Does she appear now? Well, she, <laughs> she's dead. She's dead, but her work lives on. And she, f she figured out a lot of ways to regulate the commons so that it can last for a sustainable sure. period of time. So I just wanted to bring her name. A couple of weeks ago, I was at a conference that Berkeley College put together called Rethink Music. And Imogene Heap, Heap Skyped in from London. And the same day, she was releasing a new piece of mu music with blockchain. Right? And so this conference, Rethinking Music, was all about how do we, what's the business model now that the business model is broken? And they were looking towards blockchain. So this is a coming. So are you violently agreeing with Corey? I, I don't know enough about this stuff to agree with anyone. I'm just bringing stuff up that I saw happen, that I know is on the horizon, because uh -huh. I was there. So these people from the music industry yep. were looking at blockchain. Next week, this, this group will be discussing blockchain, from what I understand. Uh -huh. So could you talk a little bit about blockchain and what that might mean in relationship to DRM? So I'm a giant fan of uh, append-only logs maintained by untrusted third parties that we can nevertheless interrogate and reconcile. I think that's a, that is a like, groundbreaking, amazing thing. I think blockchains are really, really inefficient, computationally inefficient ways of doing them. I think they're deliberately computationally inefficient. Uh, I like Merkle trees better. Um, if you're interested in that, I wrote a, a cover story with Ben Lurie in Nature Magazine a couple of years ago about Merkle trees. They're already in technology that you use every day if you use Chrome. Uh, it's how certificate transparency works. Uh, way more computationally intensive. It would suck if the only way we could make uh, currency and entertainment and lots of other things work is to burn all the coal left in the ground. Uh, so I'm skeptical of blockchain. I also don't know about the currency project. Uh, the currency project seems to me to be uh, to kind of smack of bubble nomics, and I I don't know what to make of it. Um, can it would we be great if the proof of work could be applied to hard problems that people actually need to solve? So there's an underlying problem with proof of work that is that I'm cribbing from Ben Lurie on here, which is that proof of work d rests on the idea that the uh, cost of doing the proof is less than the cost of the th of um, uh, generating of, the work of the work. Yeah. Yes. So in the case of blockchain and bitcoin this is really hard because the cost of doing compute of, com of computing is highly variable right we have new chips all the time we have new gpus we have new breakthroughs 
the cost of, uh, uh, of the value of all of the Bitcoin is highly um, uh, uh, variable as well, right? It goes up and down. And we've already had moments in which 51% of the computation in the blockchain was controlled by one person. But the thing that nobody talks about is the moments in which uh, the blockchain is worth so much and computing gets so cheap that buying 51% of all the computing in the blockchain also becomes cost effective. And you can have localized cheap computing, right? You, because like I once gave a talk at the Oxford Computer Science Center, uh, Computer Science Club, uh, about five years ago, and these like three frothy undergraduates came up, and they were so hyped because there was no charge for electricity in their dorm, and they were never going to pay for beer again because they were like Bitcoin mining. They like they couldn't close the windows in December because there was so much heat in their dorm room. And that's all of the... how Worcester College burned down. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, can we vary the gender of the interlocutors? We've had two dudes in a row. It requires. A group effort. Right. Okay, so say I'm on board with all of this, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to make some technologies that deal with this. Uh, John Deere's engine control unit sounds like a totally hackable thing. I hack it, I extract data from it, I write a great paper with all of these data-driven insights about how we all can be better farmers because of this data. Then I want to know more about this decade that follows. So, so I'm, I'm, what I would hope you would do if you were thinking about doing that is come talk to us at EFF about how to structure your research to litigation harden it, right? To, to set it out so that what the questions that you're asking and the way that you're asking them are as clear to an eventual court as possible about what your intentions are and the legality of it. Having done that, if in the event that you get sued, um, one of the things that I'm doing is spending a bunch of time going around talking to investor conferences. Uh, that's how I started this trip at a conference in, in um, Park City, Utah. And I'm going on to two more of those talks on this trip to get them thinking about those market opportunities. Uh, once that lawsuit is in play, uh, I think that you'll see lots of analysts saying, there's, there's, you know, it, it's one thing to create like subprime uh, vehicles that try to extract the last pennies that the poorest in America have. But if you could figure out how to extract the margins from the richest in America, then you really have something. Um, and so uh, we, start, we start going after those with businesses. Meanwhile, you're going through the courts and you're going through the lower court and the appellate division and so on. But we're also, we will be scurrying around to all the organizations in the world that work with EFF on issues like this to think about how they can frame this for their own legislative debates. I think the thing that we saw with SOPA and with um, um, uh, the net neutrality fight is that while usually in a kind of late capitalist democracy you can you can handicap who's going to win any kind of legislative fight over who's spending the most right which industry is spending the most that when activists are in it's it's just a wild card uh, and so we can get industry all the firms that that want to start those SMEs or those tool vendors to enable the SMEs and activists to work together to start repealing this. But let me just ask, was your question about litigation risk, or was it a more theoretical question about sure, the kind how of world? The, how this would, how this, like, because it seems like you have an ideal scenario in which this is going to unfold. Say I'm also a diverse researcher, and I also do a save as button for Netflix because I'm doing some kind of computer vision project. Mm -hmm. And then I've created a save as button for that as well. And what if I lose that, and I win John, my John Deere litigation, then like, at, at what point can you say, oh, you know, Actually, we shouldn't overturn the DMCA. It just seems like there's. Oh well, we might be able to overturn the DMCA legislatively, but I'm not counting on that, right? I'm not counting on that, not because the case can't be made well, and not even because I don't think that we might find a plurality of Congress people who are interested in it. But I just don't think Congress makes laws anymore, right? I mean, they can't even make budgets. So, <laughs> like, you're I, looking for a Sony case for the DMCA. That's, yeah, that's the grail. That's at the right. End of your 10 so years. remember, at the end of Sony, right? The Supreme Court said. Unless Congress amends uh, uh, 17 USC, the VCR is legal. And then they were like, hey, Congress, do you want to criminalize America's dominant form of entertainment? And Congress said, no, we want to get reelected. Now, in fairness, the starting point of that was judge-made law already, a theory of contributory sure. or vicarious infringement. There wasn't right. a specific statute that That's Jack true. Valenti, if he'd had presence of mind, would have rushed through that said VCRs are illegal, at which point the, co the courts would have well, been like... Well, he had eight years to try. Yeah. Right? He didn't manage it. Right? Like but, he, it, but he got the DMCA. He did get the DMCA. That's true. Um, and, and 
So what, do you have a theory yet as to why the DMCA is, is it unconstitutional or some other reason? Yeah, I think we just, I think it's, well, I think that there's multiple theories. One is to, uh, to raise questions of fair use with better um, defendants. Uh, so all the fair use questions about whether or not circumvention for fair use is lawful have not had uh, great clear-cut cases. Um, and then the other one is to look at uh, Bernstein's code of speech mm -hmm. defense, right? In, in Bernstein, you know, before, before 1992, the NSA criminalized um, the distribution of crypto for civilian use. Uh, strong crypto, working crypto. We say strong crypto, we should say working crypto for civilian use. And... Um, they claimed that what they were allowing civilians to use was working crypto, but it wasn't. It, it was the cipher lengths were too short, and it was really easy to break. And they said, "No, it's not. All the PhD mathematicians work for us. Shut up." And we like we tried to demonstrate that they were wrong. We did stuff like um, uh, John Gilmore built a computer for a quarter million dollars that, in under three hours, could brute force the entire key space for the cipher that the entire American banking industry was supposed to be reliant on. And nobody cared. And we had economists write brief and technology just write briefs and nobody cared. But John got rich. John, no, John didn't no, get rich making Des Crackers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and then we, and then we, we he's found, just mining coins. That's right. No, he's not even mining coins. Then we found da DJB, right? Uh, Daniel J. Bernstein, who's still an eminent cryptographer, was then a grad student at UC Berkeley, who was publishing ciphers on Usenet, source code for ciphers on Usenet. And we argued that his code was a form of expressive speech protected by the First Amendment, and the Ninth Circuit upheld us at the lower and the appellate division, and the NSA went away, right? And strong crypto came into existence. We tried it once more. Right, we tried it in 2002-3 with um, with Ramirez, right, with with 2600 magazine, and the problem with it was the difference between defending the right of mathematicians to talk about math and defending the right of the Hacker Quarterly to publish hacks. And from and my perspective, hacks to DVDs, to DVDs, and, to, yeah. and from my perspective, they are indistinguishable. For, but from the perspective of a judge in New York, as opposed to a judge in California in 2000, as opposed to now in 2015. Those were, those were easily distinguishable cases, and our judge said that, um, uh, the, that 2600 was not a case about free speech, it was a case about stealing things, and we had our butts handed to us. We have a very different climate now. Um, every time that we've had a good client since, uh, the other side has run away. Um, but as I said, we have a target-rich environment now. We have a lot more people who defend on the who, def, who depend on the DMCA, and those people don't um, uh, care if the DMCA is intact if their use isn't yes. intact. And so we can provoke them. Well, there, there was a woman back there. Who I think we're question. at time, unfortunately. Okay. So um, we should just thank you for your visit, for the provocative title. It was interesting to me that the. Um, the 10 years turned out to be extremely concrete as to why it was 10 years. I mean, we don't know what this was. Right, right. Or, but you had a specific tactic yeah. in mind yeah, that yeah, yeah. I hadn't anticipated. Um, and that Kill Our DRM actually meant 1201. Yeah. That, that, and I've come to appreciation of your argument that you're really talking about 1201 as a linchpin of a system that I confess, I'm not even yet sure if I agree with it, but that that is really what you're talking about. Yeah. And that's something that most people probably, if they've thought of it at all, have thought of as, oh, that was so 1998 or 2000. It's the, the original, it's the original sin of dumb computer law. Actually, yeah. CFAA was, but it's the original, it's the other original sin. Yeah. Uh, we have mission patches at EFF now, which I don't know if we're going to be making them like membership premiums, but they're pretty cool. It's like a, a rocket ship breaking chains, and it says Apollo 1201 and all DRM in the world in 10 years. So. I'm waiting for Apollo 1301. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, I hope you'll stick around afterwards yeah. to chat with people, but we just owe you a big sure. thing. And I will... Uh, there's, um, there's copies of uh, my book, I think. Oh, yes, there. and outside. I will, I will make them non-returnable for you if you'd like. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.